All right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this AGA Live. Um, my name is Lindsay Sharman. Uh, I am the curator of the Art Gallery of Alberta. I'm very excited to be hearing today from the Icelandic artist Rafnildur Arnardóttir, uh, or also known as Shoplifter, uh, who is currently in an exhibition at the AGA called Roy G. Biv. The exhibition is all about color uh, and the power of color and how it can shape us and our public and private spaces. The show is up now and runs until uh, January 2nd. The AGA and I are situated on Treaty 6 territory. We are also in Edmonton, uh, the traditional land of diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Inuit, and Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis people who make their homes on uh, territories that now intersect the current borders of Alberta. I have a lot of connections to various places within Treaty 6, um, but my great-great-grandmother came to Edmonton in 1896, just 20 years after the signing of Treaty 7, or Treaty 6, sorry, uh, and although I am not from Edmonton, nor are my parents or my grandparents, when my great-great-grandmother arrived here from what was then Russia, Russia, she lived in a home just a few blocks east from where I am sitting right now. So Shoplifter uh, is joining us from Denmark, although she is from Iceland, uh, and is one of Iceland's leading contemporary artists. She works with both synthetic and natural hair. Her sculptures, wall murals, and site-specific installations explore themes of vanity, self-image, uh, fashion, beauty, and popular myth. For Shoplifter, hair is the ultimate thread that grows from our bodies. Hair is an original creative fiber, a way for people to distinguish themselves as individuals. And humor also plays a large role in uh, both her life and work. Shoplifter um, represented Iceland at the Venice Biennial in 2019, and her installation, Chroma Sapiens, um, which, uh, with her installation, Chroma Sapiens, which received uh, worldwide attention and press. Chroma Sapiens later traveled to Iceland, opening at the Reykjavik Art Museum in January 2020, and I believe is now uh, permanently installed in Reykjavik. Shoplifter has exhibited in notable museums and galleries worldwide, including MoMA in New York, uh, National Gallery of Finland, National Gallery of Iceland, uh, the Walt Disney Concert Hall in LA, uh, Queensland Art Gallery of Modern Art in Australia, among many, many, many others. She is the recipient of the Nordic Award in Textiles uh, and the Prince uh, Eugene Medal for Artistic Achievement, from the King and Royal Crown of Sweden. So before we get into it, I'd like to thank um, some of our sponsors. Uh, thank you to both EPCOR and Canada Council for their generous support. Uh, our online programming is brought to you because of the generous support of the EPCOR Heart and Soul Fund. And also thank you to Helen and Michael, um, who are here behind the scenes with us helping out today. Um, so for our event today, I'm going to hand it over to Shoplifter in just a moment. Um, she's going to share um, some images of the work um, and talk a little bit about her practice in general and show some projects. And then towards the end, um, I'll come back on uh, with some questions for her and I'll also uh, share questions that come from our audience. So if you have um, any questions like you'd like to ask, your way of interacting with us is through the Q&A function. Um, so with that, um, Shapi, I will hand it over to you if you're ready to go. Sure. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for inviting me um, to uh, give uh, an artist talk. I'm really happy to be in the exhibition. I wish I could have uh, come to see it, but um, I guess that, uh, you know, I'll have to wait to another time to come to Alberta. Um, I'm currently in uh, uh, Aros in uh, Denmark, uh, installing a show here at the Aros Museum. 
And um, yeah, um, my name is Hrapnil Drarnardotir. Uh, it's uh, a very normal Icelandic name, but uh, when I moved to New York uh, 25 years ago, somebody misheard it. You know, it was hopeless for them to pronounce it. And somebody said, nice to meet you, shoplifter, got back to me. And uh, me being the hopeless uh, humorist, I thought it was hilarious. You know, I'm not a shoplifter. I will I want to make that clear. And um, so I just kind of went with it. And before I knew it, uh, it became my um, my official name, my, uh, you know, artist name. So I'm born in uh, Iceland, Reykjavik, uh, um, and uh, went to the art university in Iceland, studied painting, graduated in uh, 89, no, yeah, yeah, 89. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, I was in a painting department and I was always kind of like, oh, you know, it's like I, I wanted to go abroad and uh, um, study, do my MFA. And when I was thinking about where to go, I thought of Europe or I thought of New York, which I've been to, you know, I had been there for a graduation project, a graduation uh, um, trip. So when I pictured myself in Europe, I always saw it in black and white, and then I saw it in color if I thought of myself in New York. So I, I guess I went with the color. But color took a while to get into my artwork, nevertheless. Um, so here we have uh, um, an image uh, from my first uh, solo exhibition in New York. Uh, I graduated from the School of Visual Arts in 96. And um, for the next years, you know, I would uh, experiment with a lot of different materials. But it was not until I found these uh, hair extensions and hair that I started like really like kind of uh, finding my, you know, voice uh, as an artist, I think, you know, I come from uh, the Nordic tradition of textiles and and um, sewing and knitting and, and, and things like that. And uh, it's also, I was kind of like dealing also with my own prejudice towards, you know, these kind of female driven craft uh, creative processes and uh, wanted to kind of tackle that. And uh, painting two-dimensionally didn't feel uh, enough for me. So I think that, uh, you know, I stumbled upon, you know, such a great medium for me, you know. And here we have a solo exhibition in New York called uh, Left Brain, Right Brain. And um, I took some braids, you know, and started like kind of like adding them to the wall, creating these kind of maps, mind maps, and for the opening, I dressed myself up. You know, a lot of my work is also quite uh, performative and uh, fashion oriented. And uh, from this, uh, we could uh, show up another slide. Um, and the work started to kind of like become denser and denser. And uh, this is uh, um, artwork called uh, Right Brain. So in the beginning, I was just kind of like adding like one and one braid on it. Um, but I kind of want to explain a little bit about, you know, why hair became such a dominant uh, material in my uh, career. I think that, you know, it's just the ultimate uh, creative medium, you know, that grows on our body. It's like represents so much uh, who we are. I'm really into, you know, identity and, uh, you know, the way we choose to present ourselves with hairstyles and, and all kinds of, uh, um, you know, you know, we all have to make creative decisions when it comes to like, you know, doing something with our hair. So I think it brings out some creativeness in all of us and uh, we're very occupied by it. And so in uh, addressing, you know, it's, it's like figurative, but not the material is figurative or like uh, uh, connecting to the people. And, um, and I'm really curious about vanity and, uh, uh, pop culture. And uh, after my first solo show, um, we can show the next slide. Um, uh, I was uh, very glad because uh, um, my fellow Icelander Björk uh, came to the show and uh, was working on an album called uh, Medulla. And she asked me to uh, create the persona for this album that was only recorded with uh, human voices. So it felt right to her that she wouldn't be wearing anything but some, you know, um, uh, you know, like the hair was uh, like a sculptural body material. 
So she asked me to create something for her to be wearing on, on the on the album. And here you can see also uh, the flowers uh, that are made from human hair and also from horse hair. And then these like uh, hair pieces that I created this kind of still life uh, uh, flower painting to me, it is. Um, I think that when I was, if I go back, you know, to like why I'm using hair, I think that, you know, the first, why I started using braids, you know, my, my grandmother would have like a drawer in her vanity cabinet in her bedroom. And I would go there as a seven year old, you know, just tiptoe into there and open the drawer and see her cut off braid in the drawer. And I just found it so mesmerizing. It stirred so many like crazy, like weird, you know, feeling in me, both like this eerie, feeling of uh, a dead limb, uh, but also like something very romantic and also a, a monument to her youth because she had, had gray hair, but the braid was brown. And I think it had a really strong effect on me. And I didn't realize it until later in life when I was working with hair so much in my work, you know, I suddenly started realizing the stepping stones, you know, that bring you to a place of where you, how you uh, pick material. And I also was working in an antique shop and that's where I first came across these memory flowers. This is an old tradition dating back to the 1600s, um, both very popular in America and also in uh, Scandinavia, especially Sweden. And I found the woman who still knows how to um, do this. It's a very like, you know, specific technique that you have to learn. And usually it's taught from mother to daughter. So I started kind of sculpting more and we can see the next slide. Um, and I started like seeing the drawing within the hair, you know, the drawing that can be created and uh, the three dimensionality and doing these reliefs. This is called the star. And uh, I started creating these um, uh, planets of sorts in different colors with different braids. And to me, the paintings you know, I finally like figured out that, yeah, okay, I'm just doing paintings, you know, even though I'm not painting with paint, but uh, um, I kind of worm them around and, you know, they all, they become these kind of, um, yeah, like these surfaces that are very like kind of animalistic and, uh, um, you know, beastly, but tame. We're always trying to tame the hair that we have on our body. Next one, please. And after doing all these like brown, you know, work that was really um, connected to just wanting to talk about the humans, you know, like uh, natural hair colors. And it took me a while to put uh, all my colorfulness into my work. And it happened when I did a collaboration uh, uh, in a window at MoMA at the Modern uh, uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York. I did a collaboration with Assume Vivid Astrofocus, a art collective. Uh, that's uh, mostly uh, run by um, Brazilian uh, artists. And uh, we together did this installation that was this huge window. So first time they had this in the window there as a series, you know, and it was supposed to be up for six months. And I think it was up for 14 or something like that. And you can see on the next picture, uh, another close up. So basically these are like blinking um, neon lights that uh, Assume Vivid Astrofocus uh, uh, created. And then I uh, had, I braided all these different color combinations and uh, then I, you know, fastened them to a surface uh, to create this kind of flow of color. And, and uh, you know, um, and suddenly I was back in painting, like full on painting. Um, this was a great stepping stone in my career, I have to say. Um, it was, uh, um, it's, it's kind of interesting how that happens, you know, that, you know, that uh, you get a gig like that, that it's really um, kind of brings you to a new place in your work and uh, gives you like a certain confidence to continue when you have like all this positive feedback. And we can see the next slide. Um, I also use human hair and uh, this is made from colored uh, human hair extensions. And uh, I buy them in these colors. I don't color anything myself. I like working with found objects and uh, kind of taking it out of its context and putting it into the art context uh, and giving it another purpose and another life. 
and I wanted to create here um, this uh, kind of abstract, uh, you know, it's like um, geometric abstraction, uh, and it almost looks like uh, um, graffiti or drip paint, and uh, it has the illusion of three dimensionality. And uh, part of it is coming out of the wall, and part of it is just on the wall, but it looks like it's coming out of the wall. And um, I think that I've been joking about it that I can blame, you know, I blame Boy George from the Culture Club for all this uh, artwork that I do because uh, when I in the 80s, I would always have these like kind of outlandish hairdos, but I couldn't get any hairdresser in Reykjavik to, to give me the same hairdo as uh, uh, Boy George. And so I think this unfulfilled desire to have hair extensions that I didn't even know what was back then, um, that is to blame for, for a lot of my work. But I really enjoy putting uh, um, the colors together. It's a composition and drawing and three-dimensional kind of sculpture uh, painting. And this one is called uh, Vanity Disorder. And then from these kind of work, I started to... Uh, um, I continued using synthetic hair mostly because um, I started wanting to kind of fill up your, your spatial visual um, area in all these colors, you know, the way it affects you is very, um, you know, it, it, yeah, I read a, read a lot about neuroscience and I think that, uh, you know, I always started thinking like, okay, yes, yeah, like the map of the brain, you know, the hair, you know, this idea that, you know, the hair is an extension like of your thoughts, you know, like kind of outgrown thoughts, um, I imagine, you know, thing. And then I, I was uh, reading a lot about neuroscience and um, I started doing these installations called uh, Nervescape that were more like uh, um, landscapes. Uh, and you can go to the next slide. I think that... Uh, no, no, that is something else that I, <laughs> uh, okay, so I go back to that later. No, no, it's okay, it's okay, I'll just talk about the smileys. Um, I also figured out how to um, control the hair, you know, it's always about tame, taming the hair. First I was braiding it, and then I was braiding it bigger and using this more kind of like cheapest uh, um, hair extensions, and then um, because I was working in fashion also and like kind of doing finale pieces for, for a fashion designer, I had to create some sort of like um, fabric that would uh, have be hair. And so I figured out how to like pluck the hair with a tiny crochet needle through netting. And then, you know, I started realizing that I can do so much more, you know, um, literal uh, painting with the hair. And uh, I've done like a series of uh, these, uh, Fuzzy smileys, this one is called Bloody Smile, and uh, um, the red was supposed to be like uh, um, lipstick, but it's kind of like a little bit more like blood, I guess, hence the name. And the next one. And here you can see at the back, it's in my studio, it's the back of these smileys, and this is basically two tones of hair, like, blended together. Um, put under the net and, the, and then plucked through and on the other side is like the fussy part. And so I draw it off, you know, every single time. It's not like a, like a standardized smile. So they all become very different. I have to kind of give them a haircut. So they're like characters. And I think that my work is a lot about characters. And uh, this kind of like brought me, like showed more like the, the humorous side of myself. It, this is like a little bit like Tahting or Ria. This like very popular Scandinavian um, 70s uh, tapestry that uh, every single home had, you know, owls and sunflower, sunflowers and, and things like that. And next one. And uh, here's a pink one. So they become like this, uh, um, this series and, uh, and, you know, here, because my work is so much about pop culture, vanity and human behavior. And I think that, um, first of all, when I did the Björk album, it was uh, fantastic to kind of do um, human hair sculpture uh, on a person in this pop culture, uh, you know, uh, universe. And um, so basically, um, 
my work really dances on this kind of textile pop culture and it's uh, oftentimes uh, not about you know the preciousness of textile make, making textile artwork but I use uh, you know my attitude is more kind of you know punk or macho you know I use stable gun and glue gun and and, and sometimes also just uh, these like really tiny um, ways of uh, manipulating the, the the fibers but uh, it is fiber art and um, and I'm just fascinated with the mass production of materials or, and things in the in the world and I like to kind of use found objects because of that like you know the hair extensions are found and they're not colored by me they are you know I just find different colors and I figured out a way to kind of blend it and make it do what I want to do and uh, and I always like recycle everything you know I make artwork out of almost every single strand of hair but maybe not exactly but uh, um, I try, but uh, because I started making really large scale installations, and you can see the next slide. This was, uh, um, yeah, like after the smileys, I started doing these more planets, you know, that I call um, like almost like nebulas. And this is where I really figured out how to like start blending the hair into paintings, like, like just like blending paint. And uh, yeah, these are comets, uh, also comets, moons, and uh, planets. And uh, I found out that the Greek, uh, the, the word comet comes from Greek, and it means long-haired. It's actually like uh, a fantastic name. And uh, next one. So here I went full on into the um, three-dimensional landscape. Uh, the first installation I did in this uh, series called Nervescape was at the Clocktower Gallery in New York. Uh, Alana Heiss, curator and founder of the Clocktower Gallery and PS1, she was the first one to invite me to do this large-scale installation after she saw the MoMA window artwork. So that was like, that really like, uh, um, propelled me into this like large scale installation artwork. And even though I do that, uh, I also just do very tiny artwork, you know, from just uh, a little bundle, you know, small bundle of hair. But uh, um, here we are in uh, Australia. Um, it's over like 500 square meters of uh, surface uh, filled with hair on three. And we can show the next slide. It was, uh, it's, it went up like three floors. And um, I just wanted to create this uh, um, fantastical, uh, cartoony landscape, almost like walking into your kind of children book or, or you know, just, just be lost in another world, you know, and uh, um, transport the viewer um, from some, the, you know, from the mundane, you know, into this uh, um, supernatural, hyper nature, psychedelic uh, surfaces uh, and uh, scale that uh, disturbs your own scale. You know, you it's almost like you feel uh, when you're in front of this work, you 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 feel very that your own scale is kind of like uh, um, skewed because um, you're not used to seeing hair in such quantity and you know and and, and surface so um it's very trippy to look at too so uh it's a way to um yeah make, make a trip without any drugs <laughs> and we can go to the next one and uh, the Nervescape series uh, started taking on all kinds of shapes and uh, um, they moved from the wall to the, uh, into space. And I started uh, um, using the hair to create these uh, strands and uh, almost like a, uh, like a web or like a, like a systems, like veins and uh, um, all these like organic, uh, shapes that are so parallel from the microscopic to the macroscopic to the you know to the galactic and um using these colors i'm really just painting three-dimensionally and drawing in space and um 
And there's something about creating a space, you know, that is so immersive. Most is it's like, you know, it really like affects your senses. And um, and after like working with uh, these uh, Nervescape installations, uh, I made up this name Nervescape. It's like made from uh, nerve endings and uh, landscape or escape. So it's about, you know, escaping into another, um, like, like a book or, or, or sci-fi movie or another um, dimension. And it's very psychedelic and uh, uh, it has a really like positive effect on me to work with these colors. And I felt like, uh, you know, the, hair, the texture also um, affects your emotion as well because we are also used to our own hair and uh, so we identify with the texture, but it is also interesting to see, um, you know, there's a, there's like some gray area where, you know, beauty and, uh, um, and uh, disgust meet, you know, because uh, a lot of us, you know, like, you know, when the body is on our body, it's uh, beautiful and it's pride and joy, but once it's off the body, it's kind of repulsive. And so it is, uh, very kind of beastly and uh but it's also because of the colors reminds us of teddy bears and uh, um stuffed animals and and uh so i wanted to create these like three-dimensional painting but you could never like see it all in one from one um angle and um uh and these kind of strands of hair you know i figured that you know like the colors they kind of you know penetrate your retina and uh activate uh, the neurons in your brain and, uh, and then I later read that uh, I'm actually scientifically completely right you know it's <laughs> I'm just a realist um, that it actually affects the brain in a way the colors that uh, um, that the nerve endings start to pump out these feel-good uh, um, uh, I mean what do you call it like the, the ox you know serotonin and uh, and all of these uh, feel good uh, uh, oh, I'm looking for a word second language is man uh, yeah um, so basically like starts to pump your brain with these feel good uh, um, feelings and uh, um, so it affects you in a way that um, makes you kind of like forget about uh, other things and this is very meditative to look at and next one Uh, these are called fathoms. Uh, so I started making these uh, just singular um, compositions of uh, site-specific installations from these uh, long strands of uh, um, hair columns, uh, kind of like floating trees or sculptures uh, in space. And um, where I mix the colors uh, um, together to create this kind of uh, cartoony and pop paintings that are three-dimensional. And next one. And that brings us to um, uh, the show uh, at the museum uh, where when uh, I was offered to exhibit, you know, um, in this room, I soon realized that uh, I would like to create this kind of labyrinth of uh, fathoms that that, uh, um, you know, kind of like uh, trigger your senses and um, you kind of roam around and you're just like, it's, like it's also almost like going, you know, through, um, you know, like a car wash or, or something like that. Um, but uh, they really like, uh, um, yeah, I wanted this, like this uh, square, like when you come to this show, that this uh, entrance into the installation becomes its own painting. We're always talking about paintings, um, like, you know, being a window into another world or into the, you know, mind of the, of the painter. And here you can actually step into the painting and be one with it. And um, it's a very kind of meditative uh, um, place to walk through. And I specifically, um, also, for the first time, kind of managed to use uh, carpet to for the floor and the walls, 
and it just kind of makes makes for like this complete textile experience that you are like in this soft fuzzy place you know with uh, um and the sound it also affects the sound so like you know it uh, um it diffuses it so that uh it is uh womb like maybe i don't know and um and yeah and it's a painting once and for <laughs> yeah painting like paint brushes and the next one yeah and here you see like how it can no matter like where you are you know you always see a new combination of colors and so you can move through it and uh you will never repeat your your mind you, you, your eyes will never really see the same painting so it's like flashes of uh, color that uh, um it's really energizing i think yeah and then uh, I think I had some images from uh, uh, the Venice Pinale. Oh, no. Lindsay? No. Helen, do we have more images? No. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so basically, you know, that's, that's, uh, you know, um, what I wanted to tell you about more or less, you know, I mean, yeah, do you have any? Did you want to, you know, maybe just talk us through um, the Venice installation a little bit? Yes. Um, so uh, when I was selected to represent Iceland at the Venice Biennale in 2019, I wanted to really like for the first time create this 360 degree uh, environment with uh, sound as well. So it would become like this multi-sensory uh, experience and the work uh, I named it uh, Chromo Sapiens. So I'm basically kind of in that piece, I'm naming the viewer more than the artwork really, because you kind of enter as Homo Sapiens, but you leave as Chromo Sapiens with a higher, mm -hmm. um, uh, color wisdom you know so that's why i was also so happy to be in this show it's all about color because uh I, it's very important uh in my life you know and uh it does uh, um really affect people in positive ways usually um you know the well-being and mental state so i'm really into that because from coming from iceland you know growing up in all this darkness you know we have the seasonal affective disorder mm -hmm. and is light therapy for that but i think that color can also be very therapeutic and uh you know green and uh, blue and you know these like typical kind of nature colors mm -hmm. uh, they they affect the brain you know the brain starts to you know make this feel good uh, um chemicals in the brain and so the piece in uh, venice was like yeah you would walk into a cave that was very dark uh, small kind of like the dark cave and then you would come into like a really colorful one and uh end up in this kind of white uh ephemeral one so i wanted to create three different experiences and uh, i had this icelandic band uh, ham that would uh, create the soundtrack for it because sound brings like breath and time to to uh, to the installations i think that become less static and I think that you, as the viewer, spend different amount of time when you, more of your senses are triggered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it's super interesting the the installation at the AGA because there there is no audio component to it, but it does have a very specific like acoustic. Yeah. Thing. And I know, like, I'm I'm sorry that you've never been able to experience it, but it's really, really wonderful. And it's really like, you know, it's something that I never expected from the work. But, you know, you walk into the gallery and it's, you know, huge high ceilings and concrete floors. And, you know, it, it kind of feels a certain way. And it's like, as soon as you cross, cross the threshold into your installation, like, there's this, like, 
dampening that like you you feel yeah. and like it it is the change in acoustics but you feel it like in your entire body when you when you kind of walk yeah. in mm -hmm. and so yeah it's it's interesting that it, it kind of even without you know something playing it does have this kind of like cozy acoustic yeah and I think the quietness can also be its own soundscape, you know, mm -hmm. the, the dampening of, uh, and you become differently aware of your own movement sound, you know, that you make and, uh, and then, you know, they move themselves, you know, they, they, they mm -hmm. are hanging, so they are loose and, um, and you move around it and that moves around it too. So um, there's a different sense of movement there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so in Venice, you had this kind of progression um, that you know you're you're working with different types of colors in in different spaces, and I, I think that is to you know kind of give a different feeling, whether it's you know sort of like lighter pastel colors or more deeper colors. So mm -hmm. how do you decide what sort of feeling you want to have in an installation? Well, it depends on the space. I think that uh, um, when I, I'm doing these site-specific installations, you know, this, the, the way I tame the hair and the way I put it together is very much, you know, in response to the space. Mm -hmm. um, I can kind of see it in my head, you know, before, um, but then, you know, it all happens in the place, you know, there is no fixed idea, you know, for example, with the placements and, and the colors, you know, it's, um, a lot of things just happen in the place, and uh, but with the Venice Biennale, um, I uh, because I wanted it to be like you're entering the belly of the beast. You're going into a cave, and you know how you know I've been to the salt mines in Poland, and you know cave, different caves, uh, and you know the darkness. You know because that's why it started with like this really black, uh, um, smaller kind of opening. I wanted you to kind of like forget everything immediately what was before you entered um, and uh, it's kind of like the blackness kind of cleans uh, your palette in a way and um, and also um, the first cave I named all the caves the first cave is called um, Primal Opus and it was dedicated to the heavy metal band that created the soundtrack for me mm -hmm. so it had to be goth and uh, um, <laughs> kind of dark and you know so you just kind of whoa, you're gonna feel it when you um kind of walk in and you're like into you're immediately in a different world and then you come into this cathedral like big cave uh with these crazy colors these psychedelic onslaught of uh, uh visual stimulation and um and you know, and that's, you know, and it's really trippy, you know, it's, it's really psychedelic, you know, I've never taken LSD or acid, but, you know, it's almost like analog, like, you know, the healthy, <laughs> the healthy <laughs> acid. Analog acid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also like, uh, um, these like, you know, inventive uh, um, uh, places through uh, cartoons, uh and uh, um video games and things like that you know i'm actually like doing digital visions in analog you know so i like the fact that it's tactile you know to touch mm -hmm. is very important to me and the viewer is allowed to touch and pet it as long as they don't uh, uh, start swinging in it like tarzan or something you know <laughs> and, and i sometimes say that you can pet it like an old shy mammoth at your own you know so like uh, um, because uh, for me the tactility you know like hypersensitivity to uh, texture uh, plays a big part in, in in why I chose this material I think um, mm -hmm. subconsciously and so playing with uh, fibers is you know very soothing and, and comes very natural to me I would do all my friends hair when we were like teenagers and <laughs> and uh, be like braiding and and, and uh, playing with uh, fabrics and making my own clothes and stuff like that. So that has to, a lot to do with uh, the, 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 the touch. So I want people to to be allowed, you know, to also um, experience that, that sense, you know, of touch. Mm -hmm. Just look at it. So it's, uh, 
it's it's a yeah you can't touch the artwork <laughs> yeah yeah and it it's definitely you know like it it kind of um i guess it's it's interesting when you said like you like named the venice installation you're like naming the people that are going into it rather than this yeah. like thing of you know kind of even switching the point of view or the focus from like of museum visits where it, which is usually sort of like a, a hands-off kind of distant yeah, yeah. experience that I you're think, sort of yeah at. and I and I wanted you know it's very immersive and I and, and multi-sensory and it triggers you know so many like it, it really has a strong, you know, effect on you usually, you know, to be uh, surrounded by the work, you know, it's my experience, you know, mm -hmm. to now, not everybody, of course, you know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, enough people have told me that, you know, how they experience it. Yeah. But uh, um, so the first cave in Venice was called Primal Opus, and then the big colorful one was called uh, Astral Gloria, because to me, it's like the, the colors are screaming at you they're like operatic you know mm -hmm. and um and loud to you know i you know i feel like the colors are loud you know they're like really um uh bright and uh, pop they pop at you and um and there's there's so much going on so that's uh, why i created also this kind of white more pastel uh cave called uh, opium natura and that one is to kind of, you know, calm, like calm you down, like, you know, and like let your body kind of like slowly kind of, kind of, you know, like slow down on the triggers from all the colorfulness. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it's a journey and uh, it's a journey through these kind of different color palettes uh, from like black, dark to, um, you know, multicolored to this more kind of white, um, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, calmer to calm, like just calm down, you know, your senses. Mm -hmm. But in, in, but ultimately, I think the viewer is the destination because uh, it, it, it moves you in a way that, uh, um, that your experience, you know, activates the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think in, in the one in the AGA too, like it's, it's kind, it's a lot more like, free form I guess that you kind of you walk in you only have to just come over the threshold and then you know the ways of moving within that space are really really infinite and really up to the viewer yeah and a lot of times you know people sit down and they lay down I mean at least I do a lot also like mm -hmm. um just you know kind of it's it's a, it's a place to dwell it's like it, it invites you to kind of nest in it. And to me, it's like a charging station. Mm. It charges my um, batteries, my, my energy, my, my, my well-being. Um, and it just uh, uh, seems to affect people in extremely positive ways, you know, um, from children to, to older generation and everything in between. Teenagers, you know, identify with it too. So it's like super interesting that I'm doing this pop culture um, artwork and pop art. And uh, it really it speaks to people, you know, not only people that are always uh, looking at art and go to museums a lot, but uh, we had a tremendous amount of people go and see the show in Iceland, for example, and in Venice too. Also like in Kiasma in the National Gallery in Finland. I mean, uh, people are really drawn to it, and um, and uh, kids ask to go again, and again, and again, and again. And a friend of mine had to take her son seven times, you know, with different friends and stuff like that. But that makes me so happy, you know, that there is a generation of, uh, you know, few generations of kids and teenagers that like think, you know, museums are like, oh my god, um, that uh, that uh, it speaks to them because. Mm. of the, the, the simplicity in the entangled you know universe that I create but um, it is just so like pure color um, onslaught it's like an exploded rainbow and uh, we all kind of uh, and it and it you kind of like drop all your defenses you know and you just don't even feel like you have to analyze it to yourself, you know, mentally, like, uh, um, or like, uh, um, 
I think I think that you know you just become very like pure uh, uh, emotional uh, nerve. Mm -hmm. That uh, it the new the neurons are affected, you know, and you like uh, don't try to overanalyze it, you know. You just kind of become uh, part of it mm -hmm. without all the baggage of uh, what's outside the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, names and the titling of your work are super important to you. Um, I had yeah. no idea that Comet meant long hair. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, yeah. Um, and so our installation at BJ is called Hyperlings. Um, mm -hmm. You've also referred to some of like the structures as fathoms. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, maybe both fathom and hyperlinks, how you came to those titles and, and your kind of yeah. interest in titling? Yes, it just took me, took me a while. It just like with the color, like took, took me a while to kind of step out of my um, comfort zone when it came to um, Lang using language uh, for the titles of my installations or my artwork and you know I, I I was happy to hide behind untitled for the longest time you know uh, and then I became more kind of confident in like uh, the context and the content uh, and the intention of the work and and that's when like the titles started really kind of seeping in and uh, I'm really that's like a very satisfying process you know when I'm looking for names you know um, trying to figure out names for the installations and you know the nervescape for example is like this combination you know like I'm, I make up words if I want to you know and um and uh I would call them nervelings like like uh like nerve endings and uh and then hyperlinks is uh because um it's like hyper nature it's like uh, it's like such an exaggerated nature and links is like these kind of falling, you know, um, yeah, like, yeah, like, so hyperlinks is this, this uh, um, endings, you know, these like hyper, um, hyper, hyper endings that kind of fall, you know, like float in the space, you know, almost like they're like these alien, fuzzy aliens, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, fathom, I refer to them also as fathoms because, um, that's one of the words that I was also um, working with, uh, and fathom in Icelandic, uh, fathomur, and fathomur and fathom is actually like this, uh, um, you know, measurement, uh, um, you know, like how, how when you're measuring um, the depth of uh, water, for example, they would have mm -hmm. a rope and like one fathom, two fathom, because mm -hmm. fathom is from one uh, palm of the hand to the other from holding the, so you stretch it out, that's one fathom, two fathoms. Uh -huh. And in Iceland, that's the same word as to hug, to, to fathom. So it is to like, um, you know, hug somebody. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, and it's the same as like, when you say that, you know, you can't fathom something, as you can't get your way around it, you can't, grasp grasp it you know so I like this kind of workplace and um, I'm really into languages and uh, um, I, um, I just like to kind of find the nuances and uh, because I come from Iceland and then I lived in New York for 25 years I think that I enjoy like using both languages to kind of like bring about the titles mm -hmm. somehow. yeah so I think that the titles are inspired also by, you know, coming from another country with another language. Yeah. And it's kind of how I also find different names in English. Mm -hmm. So I sit yeah, down in English Icelandic uh, um, dictionary. That's what I asked my parents to give me when I moved to New York. And I just sit with it and I start, <laughs> I open it here and there. And, and suddenly like it starts to come to me what exactly it is that I need it to be called. Mm -hmm. Um, you've mentioned uh, taming quite a few times, mm -hmm. um, you know, in like, I think that like very like intricate works that you showed initially, like the braids, mm -hmm. um, but then also you talk about it in relation to more of the installation works. Could you talk a little bit more about your kind of ideas of taming uh, and yeah. why that's interesting to you? 
Yeah, because I think that in the beginning, you know, you know, it was a lot about controlling the material because, you know, mm-hmm. hair is just, we're always trying to tame it, you know, because it's like we have good hair days and bad hair days mm-hmm. and it doesn't do what we want it to do, you know, like I was like, okay, I can have like this here and like I had to put like pins, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, it's sculpting and, um, but it's also the remnant of the beast in us. You know, in movies, when, you know, there's a love scene and the woman takes out, you know, her ponytail. So it's like to let loose, you know. So it is connected with uh, um, the wildness and the uh, um, primitive uh, nature of, uh, you know, be it behavior like sex or, or, or anger or whatever, you know. So... I'm interested in this mythological ways that uh, hair has been given all kinds of uh, power, you know, and uh, we have an Icelandic, there's a lot of like uh, myths, you know, like, uh, you know, woman that had really long hair and, uh, um, you know, and uh, wouldn't want to give, you know, a lock of her hair for um, the bow of her husband, uh, you know, so like, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, sign of power and uh, we are very upset uh, upset if we lose our hair you know and uh, Mm -hmm. it is very emotional and and uh obsessive it's it's so obsessive you know the 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 whole industry and and the fact that they are like creating these hair extensions multicolor you know i'm still blown away by the absurdity of it Mm -hmm. and you know and i'm also like addressing mass production you know and criticizing you know like well not criticizing but pointing out you know the absurdity of this uh, consumerist mass production at the same time i become the problem you know too because i am a i'm con- the consumer as well mm-hmm. but, uh, but uh, because it's artwork you know uh, it's a different kind of way of uh, seeing it because artwork is always trying to last forever and i'm sure that it's going to last quite long and I also like recycle all the material constantly, you know, um, to be able to, because I don't want to like, you know, put it out in nature, you know, as long as plastic mm-hmm. is uh, within the cycle. But mm-hmm. I think that uh, it, uh, there is, you know, it's like wildness and puppets and, you know, this kind of imagined uh, primitive, uh, you know, climbing uh, vine and uh, um, growth. Mm-hmm like hyper nature mm-hmm. um right we if anybody has any questions they want um i don't have any yet so i'm just going to keep asking you things um there is a certain kind of duality in your work perhaps, you know, you're ta- like they are, you know, these synthetic or, or plastic materials at times, at times you're using um, natural hair, but the forms themselves are kind of this very like organic, um, kind of natural-ish, <laughs> even yeah. though they are kind of these unnatural colors. So could you uh, talk a little bit about this kind of like blending of like natural, unnatural? Yeah. I think that, you know, the work is very much uh, expressionistic uh, landscape painting, you know, in three dimensional uh, environment uh, kind of format. And um, I'm really intrigued by the way forms in nature behave and material behaves because there are these like parallels, you know, like I said, with, uh, with uh, um, you know, everything like, beha- like there are so things behave the same, you know. And um, plant life and growth. And if you think about, you know, I mean, I was just watching like a fantastic uh, fungi and just to see it, the way it grows. I mean, I'm like, yeah, you know, because there is a certain like uh, patterns and movement that chaos, you think something is chaotic, but it like climbing vine, but it's not. And when you start seeing it more, it's just like there is this, this uh, fractal um growth in it mm-hmm. and um little did i know after i had been doing these uh, nervescape series for a long time um 
I'd done like six of them or something. Then I saw on the news that they had uh, um, uh, put out uh, the latest uh, um, brain scans of the uh, neurological pathways in the brain. And I was completely shocked because it looked exactly like my work. So, you know, my imagined world of interior landscape of the brain um, was actually spot on. I mean, they put the, the add the colors to see, you know, where each uh, thought uh, um, uh, nerve endings, you know, uh, correspond to this brain and this part of the brain. I mean, and, um, but it's like this feathery kind of, and it, it behaves the same, you know, and, and there is a certain repetitiveness in nature that um, I like working with as well. Mm -hmm. um, you've worked in a lot of, um, or in a few like collaborations. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's also maybe like an interest in sort of like using the material as like a, a collaborator, given that, you know, you're not um, dyeing it to specific colors, you kind of like take it as it, as it comes in and work with it. And I know that you also have a, a great interest in um, neuroscience. So have you ever, or would you ever, maybe you have something in the works of, you know, collaborating with different like scientists or neurobiologists or anything like that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am, um, you know, we're, we're just waiting for the time when we are in the same place. You know, there's a, a brain surgeon neuroscience scientist in uh, New York that uh, I, I was introduced to by Alana Heiss, mm -hmm. um, that is totally up for collaborating with me on uh, artwork that really like kind of combines exactly like you say the um, you know, be because of these uh, um, brain scans. And uh, mm -hmm. so I wanted to kind of make new work that would be the mapping of, of feelings and, uh, and brain imagery. And um, I've done also like some 3D printed uh, uh, kind of imitation of uh, the neural landscape in the brain uh, combined with hair and uh, so, but uh, I always fall back on the analog. Uh, it's just the, 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 the touching of, you know, that mm -hmm. seems to be like the biggest trigger in my uh, creative uh, um, practice. Mm -hmm. the, actual, the actual making of it, you know. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to like uh, these things, you know, um, that I've been doing lately, these large scale installations, you know, been like 12 of them or something over six years. And um, of course, I don't, uh, I don't get to, to make it all myself. You know, I, I uh, count on the help of a lot of really um, talented uh, uh, assistants that help me like mix the colors. And uh, I give them also a certain freedom to, to be creative, you know, so that it's not just like, I want this and this and this. So my biggest inspiration is people also just just the human being you know and uh, mm -hmm. our behavior and that's why also i read about uh, psychology and uh, uh, neuroscience and uh, uh, i'm just fascinated i mean i would probably be you know you know like uh i would what's what's the english word for like studying the human behavior uh psychologist yeah like just uh, you know just the, the human behavior is just so inspiring to me. And I think that the material comes from pop culture. Uh, it's sold to be added to your own hair. Um, hair is this like crazy uh, obsessive uh, part of our body that um, we go out of our, go such lengths to, to um, play with. And uh, you know, this industry and, and you know, how many hair gels and hairsprays do we need, you know? Mm -hmm. is this, Sane, you know, and shampoos. I don't know. I'm just really like kind of fascinated in uh, obsessive behaviors, I guess. <laughs> um, right. I think we're we're kind of just uh, approaching an hour, but I did want to ask you uh, one more question before we go. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know if 
COVID has changed how you think about your work. Um, I think, you know, especially thinking about, you know, COVID hair. I haven't had my hair cut in years. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. do, you, do you think about your work kind of differently in this kind of new context that we find ourselves in? Well, I think that um, it's interesting because uh, um, during COVID, you know, I went to Iceland with my daughter and just stayed there for a year and a half, you know. Mm -hmm. um, part of me was really relieved, you know, that I could just go and be in the same place, you know, for all this time because I'd been traveling a lot and was scheduled to travel for shows. Mm -hmm. And um, the stillness and the, and the um, you know, to be in place uh and not be able to be so out and about and just so like obsessive you know in a way um had uh, a big uh, influence on it but i don't think that it uh, i don't think that necessarily the the way we responded uh, to not being able to go to the hairdresser you know um mm. but uh but when it comes to touch you know, and also like just the way we ourselves like touch our hair or touch somebody else's hair, our kids or, you know, our spouse or something like that. And, uh, and it kind of, it, it's more, I didn't, it's more just kind of confirmed a lot of the things that I've been thinking about, you know, when it comes to our association with our own hair mm -hmm. and uh, to get it like to, to the, the fact that it grew out of control. You know, yeah. <laughs> the fact that I could observe how, uh, you know, huge topic it was, how, how, how much people talked about it, that they felt mm -hmm. like so stressed and irritated that they couldn't, like, you know, people, you know, they were, you know, growing beards. And, and I just think that's fascinating that um, it just goes to show, like, uh, um, even more, you know, how I've been seeing um, our relationship with hair. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the, the biggest impact it had on me and my work really was that I was, uh, you know, don't leave me too long to my own devices in one place because I ended up um, opening up uh, um, my own museum in Iceland. And uh, it's called Hövestöden, which means uh, headspace or headquarters. Uh -huh. And um, I bought uh, together with uh, my business partner, Lilia, Baltes has uh, been working with me as a producer of my projects for five years. So basically what uh, I found these uh, old barracks, uh, like army barracks uh, mm -hmm. from the Second World War when they were like the US uh, Navy was using them from bombs, shelters. Then they were moved to Reykjavik into like potato nursery because we are so peaceful in Iceland. We just, okay, yeah. <laughs> potatoes in there and uh, I decided that uh, I wanted a permanent home for uh, Chromo sapiens mm -hmm. so uh, the Chromo sapiens has been installed permanently now in Iceland and so basically maybe what had happened to me during COVID was like you know I, I got to go home for the first time in 25 years and stay there for all four seasons and more mm -hmm. and uh, and this kind of bring like something came out of it that is like my work is going to be like firmly rooted literally in Iceland now mm -hmm. and uh, I've always been you know was, you know taking a part in Icelandic uh, art scene and all of that but you know I'm the first woman to open up her own museum or a temple over her own work uh, um, mm -hmm. while alive and doing it herself mm -hmm. and uh, I'm very proud of that and I think that uh, it is very much like kind of uh similar to i mean a lot of the old sculptors uh, um used to do that or you know and uh, but it's kind of like a macho thing to do and um i kind of have fun with this kind of feminine uh, macho kind of duality mm -hmm. masculine and feminine like you know i use a pneumatic staple gun when i make my hairy artwork so it looks very precious but it's made with a lot of force and action mm -hmm. this is death metal and uh, um <laughs> But so, yeah, I, I think that uh, maybe like the standstillness, you know, to like per the permanence, just mm -hmm. the permanence of you and your life and your place and just kind of like to pause and nest and dwell in yourself and stand still mm -hmm. kind of resulted in me wanting the work to just kind of have a home, not be 
traveling around the world and just kind of like belonging, just sense of belonging, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. Um, <laughs> congratulations on the Thank new you. space. Um, I knew before COVID, at least, I'm not so sure anymore, but there used to be a direct flight between Edmonton and Reykjavik. So well, yeah, okay. If, if that comes back, Iceland Air, if they come through for us, um, then, you know, we'll have a direct route to come visit for sure. <laughs> That'll be great. You're all welcome to come and uh, see the head station. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, it was really wonderful to chat with you uh, and hear more about your work. Um, and yeah, the, the show is up until January 2nd. Um, if you haven't seen it, there's still some time to come down. Um, and yeah, thanks so thank much. You for, thank you for having me and uh, inviting me to do this artist talk. And thank you everybody that uh, is watching. And I have no idea because I don't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, it's the first time I do like uh, um, like this kind of Zoom uh, lecture, but uh, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. It's great right. to be able to talk to your audience. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, bye. Okay. Bye.